Welcome, Jordan Nasser, to the podcast. Um, you're a debut author, getting two books out in 2015 uh, with Home is a Fire and then The Fire Went Wild. And Centrally Gay Romance book review blog actually named you as one of their debut authors of 2015, which I guess was a great way to end your year. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It was a great honor. I was really, really happy with that. I, I think it's really hard as a debut author to get noticed, and I think that's one of the challenges I faced is sort of navigating these waters of figuring out how to do the other side of the writing, which I, I don't know how to do, which is the self-promotion. Right. It's always a challenge, I think, uh, for any author, really, because we just all want to write books. Exactly. Uh, I would like someone else to do the hard work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so since you are new, um, introduce yourself to our listeners who, who may not have found your books yet. Sure. Uh, my name is Jordan Nasser, and uh, I'm an American living in Stockholm, Sweden, actually. I was uh, raised in Tennessee in the South, and then I lived for 13 years in New York. And in New York, I started working for a company called H&M, which was a clothing company. And I started doing advertising and was eventually asked to move over to uh, a job in Sweden, which I took seven years ago. Uh, I moved to Sweden in 2008 and worked with H&M for an additional six years. And then about a year and a half ago, I decided I wasn't having any fun anymore. I wanted to take a little break, do something different, try a new challenge. And I um, decided to take a year off. And about three months into you know, lying on a beach in, in France and just getting a tan, I thought to myself, you know, I, I don't want to walk away from this one year experience and not have something to show for it other than great experiences or you know, the aforementioned tan. And I had always worked with digital things, digital advertising and marketing and social media and video and everything I did, I realized after I left my work was nothing I could physically take with me. It was nothing I could hold. So I decided that I wanted to uh, create something that I could hold in my hand. And I, I love reading and I love books and I, you know, everyone says they have a book inside of them. So I sat down with a laptop and I just started writing. And that's pretty much it. That's awesome. And you make it that so easy, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really one of those people that, that doesn't do a lot of research into the how or why to do something. I'm, I'm literally a cliff jumper. I, I run off the cliff, and I expect there to be water below me. So I'll try just about anything once, and I'll see how I do it. And if I fail, I fail miserably and spectacularly, and it's fun. But the... The cool sort of side product of this was that I, I wrote what, what I thought to be a really fun first book. And once I finished it, I knew there was another one. So I just continued writing. But I was so nervous by how the first book would be received that I, I actually finished the first draft of the second book before I even released the first book because I wanted to be certain that I was doing it for me and not based on what other people thought of it. So I thought if the reviews were terrible for the first book, then I never would have written the second book. But now, hey, I already got it out of the way. So I did. And, and they say, too, that it's if you know you're doing a series, it's always good to have the second book kind of ready if the first one hits. Because then and, you can just follow it right up fairly quickly. And you had the second book out, if I remember right, within about six months or less. Exactly. It was about seven months after the first book came out. So the two books have now been out uh, in just about a year and a half's time. I know there's a lot of writers, and I'm in this camp, who would, who would love to leave the day job behind. What was it like for you to kind of make this leap from, you know, all these years at H&M to I'm a writer now? It's, it's actually terrifying and freeing all at once. I think the first three months uh, I sort of felt sort of figuratively drunk, a little high on life, and everything just seemed new and exciting. I was, I was having a hard time waking up. I was, wasn't really sure what my motivation was. I wanted to do everything and nothing, and I had no focus. And uh, the original plan was just to take off about three months and then jump right into another job. But I realized that, that when I started looking for another job, I wasn't ready yet. I'd been working nonstop since I was 18. I was 45 when I left. 
I wanted a vacation. So thankfully and, and luckily, you know, I'm, I'm now living in Sweden and we have a sort of different safety net to take care of someone if they're without a job and we have healthcare and, and all of that. So it was something I didn't have to worry about. So that was much easier on me. But um, it, it's really an amazing, absolutely exhilarating experience. And I've, I've been asked before if I'd like to write a book about taking a year off on your life, for your life, and then experiencing all of the fears and trials and tribulations that come with that. So that's sort of a little idea off in the distance. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about these two books. What, were, what was your inspiration for these books? I, I have an idea that growing up in the South certainly played into them. Absolutely. I, uh, my parents were, were born and raised in California, and so we moved around a lot when I was a kid. Um, my dad worked in, in a, he worked in computer software before anyone did. So he would go into a place and work there for a year, a year and a half, and then leave and move on to another project. So by the time I was in fourth grade, I'd lived in 10 different places. So I, um, I had a hard time making friends. We moved from upstate New York to Tennessee. I didn't have a Southern accent. I was a Yankee. I mean, the whole cultural diversity thing was completely foreign to me. It was very, very strange. And I thought to myself, you know, hey, it'll pass. I'll, I'll move on in, uh, in a few years. And then, of course, the, the joke upon jokes is that my parents ended up getting divorced and we ended up staying there. So I really ended up being a transplant to the South. And then I moved away from the South to New York City, where I lived for 13 years. And it was last summer, just over a year, year and a half ago, I had this time off for work and I decided to go home for a few weeks. And I think going home for a longer period where it wasn't just a few days to visit friends and family, I was fully immersed in biscuits and gravy and Dolly Parton and Southern twang and my old high school and people I'd known since I was 10 and everyone had different lives now and we were all older and more mature and it sort of struck me that, that the person who I was when I left certainly wasn't the person who I was when I returned just for that trip. And I started going through all these series of, of sort of stories in my head of what it's like to move away and to come back and sort of be a different person, but be with those friends you've always known. And that's when I, I started writing the book. So what did the folks back home think of it? You know, I was, I was really afraid actually, uh, maybe not afraid is not the right word, but I was hesitant. You know, I'm, I, I wrote a romantic comedy that featured two male leads and part of my goal with, with the book and the, the follow-up was that I wanted to write a book that my parents would be able to read that they wouldn't be ashamed or embarrassed of. And in that sort of genre of, of fiction or gay fiction, I just wanted to write fiction. To me, the book is just a romantic comedy that happens to feature two men. And that was part of my goal. I didn't want to write a book that had very heavy sex scenes. And you know, if you're looking for that, it, it's not going to be in my book. I write more of a soft romantic comedy that has occasional moments of quirky characters and weird moments in life that just pop up. And the reception from my conservative friends actually has been really, really great. And they've all enjoyed the story. And of course, a lot of them recognize moments of themselves or parts of our hometown and, and things that happened to us while we were growing up. They see that in the book. So it's kind of fun. Did I read somewhere that you did a, a reading or a signing while you were down there over the holidays? I did. It was quite amazing, actually. A friend of mine, her name is Karen Adams, she uh, sent me an email. She actually helps me to edit my writing. She sent me an email and said, you know, when you're coming home, are, are you planning on doing a book signing? And again, just to, to say, I, I don't know the first thing about marketing myself, which is amazing. I can market a fashion brand and talk about someone else to the end of time, but I'm having the hardest time trying to figure out what to do for myself in terms of, of getting the word out. So Karen said, well, why don't you do a book signing? There's a great local bookstore downtown called Union Avenue Books, and um, they love local authors and we'll set it up. So I, I did it and then we, we promoted it and then uh, the newspaper wrote about it. I had a feature story in the newspaper that you know, 
local hometown boy writes novel comes home book signing that whole kind of thing and um i didn't really think anyone would show up other than you know, people i went to high school with and friends and family and we had about 40 people there i guess it's quite good and uh, the bookstore sold plenty of copies and uh, i walked in the door a little early and i saw a friend's mother who i hadn't seen in, in years and she said hi do you remember me and i said of course i do and i turned to my head and the woman standing next to her was just staring at me and smiling and i said are you my fourth grade teacher and she said yes and she had seen the article in the newspaper so my fourth grade teacher actually came to my book signing which was amazing that's awesome that's awesome so what are your writing inspirations you said you read a lot what were you kind of thinking about as you constructed these novels yeah i'm i'm a huge fan of armistead malcolm and his whole tales of the city series and i loved how it was in a way, a, a series of very short chapters that almost had a cliffhanger at every chapter that made you want to go on to the next chapter. And I think that had a big influence on me. Um, additionally, I love the fact that he wrote this whole world of characters that felt very realistic, that had slightly quirky sides and, and had faults. And I, I love that about them, that they, they had these moments of insanity and craziness and crazy things happen to them. But this apartment complex full of straight and gay and trans, I, I loved it. So that was a, a huge influence on me. Um, I love Douglas Copeland. I love the whole Generation X and, and that sort of teen angst writing series. I love young adult literature like I mean, John Green. I'm a huge beach read kind of person. I love these books that you can take to the beach and get lost in them for two days and then go back to your real world and your, your work and all of that. But uh, in writing these, I, I wanted to create something that was similar to that, that had this sort of sense of quirkiness and fun that wasn't necessarily just straight out gay romance. How would you describe your writing process? And actually, and with that kind of, did it change between the two books? It changed drastically. The, the interesting thing is that, as I, as I told you before, I really didn't intend to write a book. I just was seeing if I could write a book. So it wasn't the main goal. And so um, I'm a huge believer that the first line in a novel is the most important line. It really, really grabs you. And one of my favorite lines in the book is from uh, Less Than Zero where the very first line is, people are afraid to merge on the freeways in Los Angeles. And I love how that sets up the whole feeling of LA and the traffic and the freeway and the tenseness. And I mean, you feel like you're in a video game when you're driving traffic in LA and I, I can't stand that. So I was actually waiting in line uh, at a club here in Stockholm well over two years ago, two and a half years ago. And this sentence popped into my head and it was, the four train is barreling down Lexington Avenue and I can see the reflection of my face in the glass of the subway door. I'm not pretty. And that ended up being the first line for my first book, Home is a Fire. And I wrote it down on my iPhone and it just sort of sat there for about a year. And then one day at work, I was having this particularly crappy day and I just wanted to close out the world. So I, I closed the office door and pulled out my iPhone and propped it up on my desk and I retyped that sentence and I just started writing organically. And the first three chapters wrote themselves fairly organically. It was at that point that someone, a friend of mine who's very smart and much smarter than I, said to me, you know, you can't just write a book organically. It can't just grow. You need an idea of where you're going. So. I, I realized that I needed to sort of pace out the book and what happens next. Um, so then I, I paced out all of the chapter titles and what happens under each chapter. I, I put little sort of, I thought of them as Twitter moments, you know, in 140 characters or less, what happens in each of these chapters. And I knew what, where the beginning of the book was and how it was going to have a you know, a moment that caused friction, and then I knew what the end result was going to be, but not exactly how it was going to be resolved. So 
in a way, the whole first book still ended up being a little more organic because I didn't edit properly. I didn't know that I should edit as I go along. I tried to edit all of the ends. And by the time you're at the end, you don't really know what you've written at the beginning. So it was a lot of learning in the first book. When I started to write the second book, it was much more strategic and laid out. I had my chapters laid out fully in advance. I knew my chapter titles. I knew I had a list of all my character names, who they were, how they were related to each other. And now I've fallen into this really nice rhythm where I edit in the mornings for about an hour, and I edit whatever I wrote the day before, and then I'll start writing new material, and I won't edit it till the next day, so it can sort of sit and digest a little bit before I get to it again. Interesting. You really went from being a pantser to a plotter, almost without knowing about knowing it, it really sounds like. Completely. I, I have, you know, that's sort of what I was afraid of. If you would ask questions in this podcast that I would have no idea how to answer because I'm making it up as I go along. I think that's what part of what makes your story so interesting, though, because there are always people who are like, I don't know how to start. I don't know where to begin. But I think it's also a matter of you don't really have to know. Sit down and write, and you'll just kind of figure it out as you go. And as you need to know stuff, you'll either ask other authors, because I, I find the author community to be very giving about you know, offering up advice, or you'll go listen to a writing podcast or pick up a book or go to a webinar or you know, whatever it takes to get you where you need to be. Absolutely. And I think uh, one of the greatest helps was a, a friend of mine. I went to his wedding last summer and his mother, Cynthia Toddy, she's a, an author. And I said, you know, I'm thinking of writing. And she said, well, put something together and just send me a, your first chapter and I'll take a look at it. And she was very giving in her feedback and helped me sort of come to the realization that I needed a little bit more structure and I needed to flesh things out a bit more with characters and and as you said, other writers have been extremely helpful and extremely giving in their time. I'm so much so that I'm amazed how helpful people have been. Um, when I finished the first book and I hadn't really edited it fully, I also you know, put a message on Facebook to all of my friends and said, hey, does anyone want to read my book in advance and, and help me with some editing? And I didn't realize at the time that I should have been very specific about what kind of editing. So I learned that afterwards. I learned that I should have said, you take a look at typos and you take a look at grammar and sentence structure and you take a look at character development and story development and you just take a look at the overall sense of, am I making a fool of myself? Is this good? Is this bad? And so I ended up with a, a bunch of comments that basically said, oh, we love it. <laughs> and that's all I got back. It wasn't really helpful. So on the second book, it, it, it helped me to realize that you you can take advantage of your friend's help mm -hmm. in, in editing, which was truly wonderful. Yeah. So this question kind of really came up from my husband because I didn't actually notice this when I was reading the books because it's not something I tend to pay attention to as long as the story is working. Right. In the first book, you wrote present tense. And in the second book, it flipped over to past. Yeah. And I was wondering if that was deliberate or if it just felt right organically or kind of what the thought was of moving from book one to book two and kind of changing up how the, what, the, what the point of view was. Yeah, in the first book, those first three chapters, they, they actually feel a lot different from the rest of the first book. And that's because they were written at such a different time. And the beginning of that first book is very present tense. It's very much about... Uh, how the main character, Derek, has been living in New York for, for 12 years and he's fed up with his life, he wants a change. And I, in some ways, of course, it's, it's a little bit of my own story, but I think that I, I took a lot of it very first person present to heart, that I wanted to really portray that this was happening to him right now. And then I got into a lot of grammatic traps that I didn't realize I had set for myself by writing a first person story which I realized probably, I don't know if it's difficult or smart or stupid, and, and that would be an interesting question for other writers. Uh, you know, do they find that writing first person or, or third person is easier? But somehow my first person switched 
from present to past, and I just stuck with it because it was much easier to stay with things that had happened because then I could tell stories about things that had happened rather than having to have that character be present every time something happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I had these strange grammar issues. Um, in the second book, I started to realize that he didn't have to be present in every situation, even though I was writing first person. People could tell him stories secondhand. So I, I learned a little few more tricks in the second book, but, but I would definitely say that the, the immaturity of my writing is definitely there in the first book and, and those mistakes. I don't know, now I find them endearing, but uh, it's kind of like in the digital world, if you have an app, you put it out and you make mistakes, but you just do it and then you try and fix it later. Yeah, and I, like I said, it didn't bother me. I didn't even really notice it because the story had me moving along right. at, such a, at such a good pace and I was enjoying it that I didn't even catch it. Right. And, and I, my husband found it because he is not a fan of first person present. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's not really a fan of first person, although I tend to write in first person a lot, although first person passed. It's, it's difficult. And I also had a lot of people comment on, on verb tenses, but uh, I can make a lot of excuses about Southern grammar. There's a lot of poor grammar in the South, and I think that I tried to make a distinct voice for many of the characters, and some of that includes double negatives or ain't or y'all and all of these yeah. things that I felt added to the character of the book. But I've had um, actually a fan in Germany wrote and she said, you know, I love this book, but your grammar is driving me crazy. But for me, it was part of the character. Yeah, it fell right in to Southern for me because I spent, I was, I lived in Alabama from fifth grade through after college. Wow. So all of that, you know, just, it worked for me because I, I'd heard so much of that through my life. Exactly. Um, what would you say your biggest surprise was through your process of, of getting these books out and working your way through the publishing world? I think that I thought, the, well, this may sound terrible, but I think I thought that the writing would be the hardest part. But for me, the writing was the easiest part. Um, Writing came very quickly, very easily to me. Uh, the writers that I, I showed my work to, that I was showing them first drafts, they were saying, you know, we hate you, these can't be first drafts. You know, your, your story is too good and it's going too quickly and you've made character development and you're giving us surprises and cliffhangers and they said, you're doing everything right. How do you know this without having been taught that? So the surprise to me came after all of that hard work the editing and then the marketing is immensely more difficult to me than the writing. And I think that was the biggest surprise. I also thought very, very naively, which is funny, that you know, all 1,400 of my Facebook fans or friends, who are really friends, I know them all, I thought they'd all buy the book the first day. And I thought they'd all rush out and, and buy it and jump on Amazon and I'd sell a thousand copies within a week. And that was, of course, a big surprise that it's it's difficult to get the word out but not only that it's difficult for people to follow up and actually purchase your book and take that step to spend the money either on your paperback or your kindle and uh, there are a lot of missteps along the way but uh, i learned a lot and i'm still learning so i'm grateful for that mm -hmm. it's it's an ever ongoing learning process because once you think you know it anyway the the process changes or Amazon changes something or a new avenue for promotion comes up or goes away or. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was uh, suddenly getting five, six, 10, 15 downloads a day on Kindle and I couldn't figure out why. And I realized I'd been placed on a top rated list on Kindle. But as soon as I took my book off Kindle Unlimited, they remove you from all of their sort of internal lists and then all of those reads went away. So it's, it's very strange, all these learning processes. So do you have advice for other authors who are preparing to make a debut? In making a debut or in writing? I'll go both. Okay, in writing, I would say everyone should try it. It's absolutely about treating it like a job. It's about carving out 
two hours a day and saying, I will sit in front of this computer or this notepad for two hours a day. And if I write 50 words, great. If I write 5,000, incredible. But you have to treat it in a very structured way. And that, I don't think it was so surprising for me because I'm, I'm very creative yet very organized and structured as well. Um, the other advice in terms of marketing was you can't expect people to just simply <laughs> fall over and say, yes, of course, we love your book, we'll talk about it. You know, it doesn't matter how many friends you have, how many contacts you have. I have friends who work for publishing companies, friends who are editors for magazines, friends who work in fashion and media across all sorts of spectrums. And you know, very few of your friends are willing to call in that favor to actually help you out. You really have to do this on your own. And that means doing the research and finding different avenues that you wouldn't consider. I mean, this is part of the reason why I reached out to you. I, a friend of mine said, hey, if you're not having luck with Twitter or with uh, you know, uh, media, then try a podcast. And so I, I went to the podcast and I looked for fiction and literature and sort of tried to narrow it down to gay, which is kind of harder on, on iTunes to find this. And that's how I found you. So um, a lot of it was cold calling and it's, it's been surprising. I, I sent an email to the advocate of, of all places, but I wrote to uh, Neil Broverman, who's the editor of The Advocate, and I said, hi, here's my story. I used to be the head of digital for h and I wrote uh, a book called Home is a Fire. It's a debut uh, gay fiction novel. Would you like to have an exclusive excerpt of the first chapter? And, and he actually did. So take some risks in writing cold calls, cold mails, cold Twitters. I can't tell you how many times I've you know, stuck Andy Cohen or Ellen DeGeneres on my Twitter feed or RuPaul. But I just think that one day it will work because other things have, so something must. Mm -hmm. I mean, you hit it, that right. You, you hit two things that I think will resonate with a lot of people. It never hurts to ask. And if you don't ask, you're not, they're not going to say yes or no because they don't know about you. Absolutely. And the other thing is, you know, treating it like a job. You know, I, I pivoted my own writing from being, yeah, I'm a writer over here on the side to at the top of 2014, no, sorry, 2015. It's like, this is going to be a business now. And while I do have this day job, now I have this secondary job to produce fiction. And it changed my mindset and it changed a lot of stuff, you know, how my head worked and it's really helped drive me forward. So I think those, those two things are awesome. Absolutely. Advice. The other great advice for me was, was learning just for myself when to edit and when to write. So I, I separated the two of them. So as I said, I edit in the morning and then I write in the afternoon fresh so that I'm editing every single day what I wrote the day before. Because I found that if you, if you wait too long, it's, you know, it's like doing the dishes. If you let them stack up, you don't want to do them. So it's just the next morning I edit what I wrote the day before. It's, as I said, sometimes it's 50 words and some days it's two or 3,000. And that has helped me immensely because now I'm at the point where I'm, I'm about uh, 28,000 words into my third book. And uh, the whole you know, path trajectory of the book is planned. And it's so heavily edited now. I've gotten to be such a pro at this that I feel like by the time I'm done with what will officially be known as the first draft, I'll, I'll almost be done, which is great because then I can get some great feedback from my friends who are helping edit. Mm -hmm. So what is coming up for you this year? You say you're you know, 28,000 words into this book. Uh, what do we have to look forward to this year? I would like to finish this third book. Um, I got a little bit derailed with all of the marketing and, and working for first book and second book, Home is a Fire and the Fire Went Wild. So the third book will take me some time to finish. So I'd like to get that out there, hopefully by the end of the summer. And then I have to decide what I'm doing with these characters. I have a, another series in my head that um, I've been gestating. And, and you as a writer, you know this. I mean, you, you have these ideas in your head that they sort of find their way out in some way. And, and you take notes all the time. So I, um, I'm continually on my iPhone at parties writing down funny things that my friends are saying. And they all say, you know, it's not going to end up in your book. 
you know, maybe, maybe not. But I'm always taking down notes. So um, in this next year, I'd like to finish that third book, and I'd like to start on the new series. Is this third book another In the Home is a Fire series? It is. It will, it will finish it out, I believe. I believe. You know, it's, it's so funny. And do you find that as you're writing, the characters tend to take on a life of their own, and sometimes they do things that you didn't plan? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. I mean, there's this you know, massive reveal in my first book that wasn't planned at all and just sort of happened because the characters wrote themselves that way. And I loved it because it made me push myself to write the story into a new direction that I hadn't planned, and it opened up all these extra doors, which were amazing. Mm -hmm. it, I, I try not to overplan a book mm -hmm. so that I leave myself open for that to happen. Smart or for when it inevitably happens, it means I don't have to, you know, rip a whole bunch of stuff out because I wasn't that, you know, finitely planned that I couldn't let it happen anyway. Exactly. I'm, I'm terrible about, I don't like to remove large sections, but sometimes you find that you've written yourself this chapter or this paragraph or this page that just simply doesn't work. And it's almost upsetting in a way, like you're killing a child, but you're, you're having to, take this back and, and push it somewhere else. But uh, parts of this other series that I'm, I'm considering writing, parts of that have already ended up in this Homes of Fire series. So I, this new series has really morphed into something that I didn't intend, but it's good because now it'll be really different from these books. Excellent. I look forward to that. Thank you. So, I prepped you in advance that you you know you were going to have to answer our question of the week for this episode. Yes. Uh, so what what is your favorite romance trope? Uh, my favorite romance trope actually is uh, enemies to lovers. But my favorite part of that isn't the enemies or the lovers part. It's the frenemies right in the middle, because I love that tension in the middle where they're still kind of enemies, but trying to figure out if they could be friends or could be lovers or could be more. And you as a reader, you don't know which direction that's going to go. And I love that, that moment of uncertainty. My least favorite trope, because I thought I'd throw that in too, is triangles. I hate love triangles because I don't want to choose between one person or another. I don't like that moment where it's too obvious that they should be with one person or shouldn't be with another person. So now it makes complete sense why Home is a Fire is the way it is, because you wrote to your favorite trope. Yeah, I wrote a lot about my favorite stuff in there. <laughs> a lot of my friends have recognized themselves, which is kind of funny. So what do you want to ask our listeners for the question this week? I actually thought about this this morning because you know, I live in Sweden, I live in Stockholm, and in, in summer we have about 22 hours of sunlight during the day. In June, July, August, it can be up to 20 hours of sunlight, which is crazy. And then in winter, you know, right now we have around 20 hours of darkness. So I think the sun went down at 2.30 this afternoon. So it is extremely dark here. Um, and I also tend to read a lot during summer when I'm at the beach, but I tend to not read very much in winter. So my question for your viewers is, how do the seasons affect your reading? The amount of reading that you're doing and the kinds of books that you're reading. Interesting. I don't even know how to answer that right off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of glad I have some time to space out my thought on that before we do the wraparounds for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Interesting. Okay, that's a good question. Thank you. Interesting to see what we get back. How did, Well, you said how it affects you. you re, you're reading more in the summer. I do. Which is interesting because I would have thought it might have gone the other way because you'd be reading more while you're hibernating. I, I think the reason for that is, is again, because I'm living in Sweden. In, in Sweden, we tend to hibernate a lot in winter and, and go to the gym and we're not very social. But in summer... You know, you leave your apartment the moment you wake up and you don't come home till three in the morning because you have all of this sunlight. So in summer, I tend to not go to the gym. I'm at the beach a lot or I'm biking or running or I'm with my friends and I'm going out. And I, 
I can't make myself work, which means write for me. So I write very little in the summer. So in that time, I'm always reading, I'm devouring books. I'll read a, a book or two, I'll read you know, two or three books in a week just to get through them real fast. In winter, I'm hibernating more and I want to work as hard as I can. But when I'm writing, I can't read someone else's work because it really affects me. So when it's winter, I don't read very much at all. So then in spring and summer, I have to catch up on all the books I missed. I, I like that, yeah. Because I, I know what you mean about the difficulty of reading and writing. I'm trying to read more this year in general because uh, I didn't feel like I read quite enough last year. Right. Uh, anything else you want our listeners to know about you, your writing? Um, I just... I just wanted to say that I'm really grateful for people who take a chance on unknown writers. I mean, there are so many of us out there and it's been really amazing getting to know so many people in this community and really uh, reaching out to others who are trying to do the same thing that I'm doing. And I think that finding these moments like meeting you, people who are taking a chance on, on someone new, I'm extremely grateful for that. So um, the advice to new writers is just as we said, try and get those doors open and just take a risk. And I'm, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you, you, you stepped forward and said, hey, I'd like to talk. Because <laughs> not only, you know, have we got a good interview here for our listeners, but I got to read two great books. Fantastic. I'm you know, so glad. Because I really, I really fell into them and enjoyed them. And I thought your Tales of the City kind of connection was very apt because there's a vibe of that kind of in there. Um, I think I even saw somebody reviewed that way on Amazon that it was it felt very Tales of the City. I would I would love to have a conversation with him one day. That's that's my dream. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's the best way for uh, the listeners to keep up on your projects? I'm very easy to find, Jordan Nasser. There aren't very many of us in the world. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Goodreads. Um, I'm always looking for new reviews on Amazon and Goodreads. So I'm so appreciative of those. Uh, I answer emails, I write back, I tweet back. So create that conversation, start that conversation, and I'll be glad to talk to you. Excellent. We'll link to all those sources uh, in our show notes for this episode. Thank you so much. So Jordan, thank you so much for joining us and look forward to seeing what's coming out later this year. I had a great time and I look forward to hearing your future podcasts.